Fortunato, HER2, we talked earlier about that we all agree mm. we want to know our HER2 status. It's not typically done. Mm -hmm. And so we in academic centers are picking this up and, and asking why? for the testing, right? So why would you care? Actually, this is very interesting. This started a few years ago. This was an observation done by some of my friends in Italy in the laboratory of the cancer in Turin and then clinically by um, the Niwarda Hospital in, uh, in Milan, respectively by Livio Trusolino, Alberto Bardelli in Turin and uh, Salvatore Siena in Milan. And we are just to give them a lot of credit because the observation started with some uh, um, uh, PDX models of uh, patients that were uh, KRAS exon 2 well type and they tried to see if uh, in the mice they were responding or not to mm. any drugs and they found a group of them that were mm. resistant to cetuximab or to anitumumab. So they went to do extensive sequencing, extensive evaluation of any potential uh, you know, growth factor or growth factor receptor gene that could be amplified, that can make sense in the pathway. And the bottom line is that about 3% of uh, colorectal cancer patients, metastatic colorectal cancer patients, have a truly amplified R2 gene. Now, if you go to the oral well type patients, this goes up to maybe four to five percent, let's say five percent. Then you have another couple, two or three percent of patients that have some activating mutations of R2. For some of these mutations, we know that this is activating mutation. For some of them, we don't know if they have any biological role or not in the disease. Um, these patients, the ones that have, uh, the, one, the patients that have a real amplified R2 gene, and actually what they have done is also that they have set a new standard techniques for immunohistochemistry for defining what we call three plus in, uh, in breast cancer, for example, with more strict um, you know, uh, parameters. In these patients, uh, according to a proof of principle phase two trial, the combination of trastuzumab and lapatinib was highly effective in terms of response rate and also in terms of long-term survival. Mm. Uh, you know, I can tell you, this is anecdotal, one patient that we put from our center in the trial was uh, a very young male, diagnosed around 41 or 42 years of age, with very aggressive disease that was uh, you know, he came to our clinic for starting adjuvant therapy. And one of my colleagues was visiting him and found lateral cervical lymph nodes. So then we did more workout, and he had already a metastatic disease after three or four weeks after the surgery, uh, or apparent stage three disease. Then he was treated with first and second line because it was RAS and Raphael type, according to for Fischetuxen first line, for Fox Bevan second line, completely resistant. And then we had this trial, hmm. and we found, actually by NGS, that it was amplified. And then we did, you know, in Mr. Chemistry, then we did uh, gene amplification. And this patient was living for about 31 months hmm. by sequential treatments wow. with anti-R2 therapies, yeah. without chemo. So he did everything you can imagine about R2. And so starting with trastuzumab plus lapatinib, and then trastuzumab pertuzumab, and then TDM1. And so he had 31 months of survival after he started. You know, this is just a clinical case, you know. But teaches you, or teaches me, a lot of things about if you find really R2 dependent tumors, also in colorectal cancer, you have something like in breast cancer, are very few patients. But you know, we spend all these efforts for MSCII, all these efforts will be rough. Also R2 is yeah, important, because be in this way we can change the, the history of the disease. Right versus left, we know HER2 tends to be more on distal the left. On, the left. on the left, so higher in rectal, yeah. high, and it goes that way, yeah. down yeah. the other way. Any other key molecular characterizations? We've got clinical data, we've got trials going forward. Tony, I know you've built a little program around HER2 and try to always have studies for HER2 positive patients. Yeah, I and mean, we're building actually a whole platform around uh, liquid biopsies and selecting targets. And so we're looking actually at even the less common targets like FGFR, RET, and try to integrate that in, in a big platform through our network. And HER2, of course, is, is a pivotal pathway, EGFR re-challenge, uh, uh, you know, uh, and a number of uh, MET, et cetera. So, so there's a lot, uh, and I think, uh, you know, what sorry, you, know, you know, another potential good candidate as a molecular target also in colorectal cancer is a rearrangement of NTRAC genes. Mm. 
Yes, no. that's still around one percent or so. Or yeah, less. But yeah, it's one or two yeah. percent. But you just found the if patient. If you found it, if you, you find, find the, the patient, you know, the response yeah. is amazing. It's, it's, it's like amazing. A but that's for, the, yeah. but, yeah. The, but yeah. that's the point is that you know now we have proof of principle with BRAF, with MSI, with HER2. Uh, you know, we're learning more and more how to refine our EGFR selection. But then, then now we get busy also looking at the less common ones: FGFR2 and TREC, uh, uh, MET. EGFR uh, 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 amplification after exposure, uh, clonal differentiation, etc. So all these things are making this disease actually much more molecular based than ever. So we're learning more and more about this and we're going to integrate those therapies into the mix uh, in a more intelligent way. And at least in the U.S., um, the, both ASCO and NCI have tried to develop access tools. So the yeah. NCI MATCH trial, for yes. example the TAPER study, which is being run by ASCO. Mm -hmm. These are ways, if you find these things, that, uh, you know, instead of begging for the drug, there are clinical trials that you can enroll patients in uh, throughout the country. Is similar sort of structure in your world to have uh, these kind of basket studies available? We do, but um, this depends on the heterogeneity in the countries, of course, but the uh, EROTC is offering these kind of studies also for yeah, we have this program, it was called the Spectacolor in yeah. ROTC, right. and then we have a, right. a lot of academic-run uh, initiatives in different yeah. countries. Yeah. Very good. But I do think that the key is to test patients early. Yeah. Uh, you know, one of the lessons you learn from MATCH, for example, is that if you wait too late, you can, you can detect uh, an actual mutation, but you may not be able to act on it. Yeah, yeah. for example, for the arrangement of NTRAC, we do when the patient starts, uh, uh, you know, first line. So at least we know that it's, you know, it's there or not. Or not. Yeah. And patients are very happy if you yeah. explain oh, yeah. them that. Yeah, absolutely. So gang, this has really been an extremely informative session. So before we end, I'd like really to give each of you a chance to give your closing thoughts. Uh, Dirk, you're first off. That's the easiest position. <laughs> <laughs> we've learned, no, uh, really also throughout our discussion here, we've learned a lot in this kind of amazing new information we have to integrate in our decision-making patients with metastatic colorectal cancer. We have predictive factors which now really drive treatment with RAS status which potentially drive treatment MSI and um, HER2 positively. Yeah. Yeah. So there is a great point in this. And um, on the other hand, we have to have two caveats. One caveat is clearly we should be cautious that we tend to over-interpret positive results. And we have to carefully wait. We have seen many case reports also being discussing here the Lazarus effect of anti-PD ones with a limited number of patients with non-hereditary cancers being published so far. HER2 also. We have good series, but these are localized series. And what I'm missing and what we still have to find, this is for me the beauty of the disease, that we are not only treating patients with drugs, we also have local ablative treatment, we also have surgery in patients with MCSC, and we have to learn what this prognostic information also teaches us for this. For example, is it worth to resect a patient with BRAF mutant MCSC, is it worth to send this patient to liver mat resection? Or is he recurring immediately? Chemo doesn't work. Potentially, he's an ideal candidate. Potentially, he's no candidate. We have also to ask these multidisciplinary questions in the light of the biological information which we do have. He's left us nothing else to say. Fortunato. Uh, I always say that uh, me, uh, colorectal cancer in general, metastatic even more, is a very complex disease, and we are learning uh, that are so many diseases mm. altogether. So it's our responsibility since the beginning. When, you see a when we see a patient with metastatic disease for the first time, mm. maybe this is the, the most important prognostic factor. What we do in terms of strategy, in terms of multidisciplinary approach, in terms of using in an intelligent way all the informations that can be even so extended, mm. and maybe there will be a confusion. Yeah. So it's our responsibility to define which is the best for the patient. And again, as I said before, we have to go back to the art of being doctors. Yeah. And so taking all the information, discussing with the patients, using uh, with, uh, in humble way, our colleagues as a surgeons, radiotherapists, uh, local treatment, whatever can be useful in the strategy. Because if we don't do in a strategy before we do the first step of therapy, maybe one year later will be less effective or too, too late. Paul, to win the Tour de France, you need a team, right? You can't do it by yourself. <laughs> well, You're I, I, I guess I find that it's amazing that everything that's old is new again, that in this era where we're 
really uh, beginning to understand uh, the complexity of a disease that we thought was relatively straightforward, um, that e something like sightedness um, <laughs> has become the most important story of our, of our disease this year. Mm. Um, and I also uh, appreciate that uh, oncology perspectives are truly global mm. and that we have a tremendous amount to learn from our colleagues around the world. We should have other members of our world take a lesson yeah, from that, absolutely. Uh, from your lips to their yeah. ears. Tony, you get the last word. So I think you know the, the most important key point from what comes out of, from this discussion is that we should always interrogate the tumor mm. and interrogate early and even consider interrogating the tumor at multiple points to uncover its molecular and genetic uh, composition because that actually allows us to uh, uh, more intelligently target and the, 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 the tumor, whether on, uh, in clinical practice and, uh, or in clinical trials. And you know, for the longest time, we've been just observing the tip of the iceberg, knowing, knowing that there's a lot uh, underneath. And I think we're seeing more and more of the iceberg. And it's not because of global warming, <laughs> because we're getting a little better vision, <laughs> because we're getting a little better vision of, 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 of the iceberg. I think we're uncovering more and more of these small, uh, a baseline uh, abnormalities that can be targeted in uh, colorectal cancer, which will soon become a lot of diseases, not just one. Okay, thank you very much for You're all welcome. that you've done, and I want to thank you guys for uh, joining us. So on behalf of our panel, we thank you for joining us, and we hope you found this peer exchange discussion to be useful and informative.